ruins of Egypt, the mysterious sculptures of Stonehenge, and the majestic hanging gardens of Babylon. And the chronology of these archaic civilizations is firmly established within academic circles and cemented in history books. So you can imagine how suggesting an alternative view of this history would render you a heretic in academia. But going against the grain doesn't necessarily mean you're incorrect. Which brings me to my next guest, Graham Hancock. He's a prolific, best-selling author and one of the world's leading experts on the study of ancient civilizations. He provides a very compelling perspective on the true origins of modern man. Earlier, I spoke to Hancock about his groundbreaking research, and I first asked him how he thinks the fields of archaeology and history have sanitized the past. First of all, let me say I don't think it's any kind of conspiracy. I think that we have uh, a large number of dedicated, hardworking, committed scientific professionals working in the field of archaeology. They feel they know what they're doing, like all scientists down through the ages. They have a reference frame that they work through. Uh, that reference frame becomes their definition of reality and they find it very difficult to accept alternative points of view. I think it's as simple as that. I, I think that you can look at archaeology in terms of the history of science and see that science has often resisted new ideas and fought bitterly to prevent them coming on board. And, and sometimes those new ideas don't deserve to come on board, but sometimes they do. And this is the way that ideas progress. Gradually, new information will come out. And if a new idea is worthy, it will be supported by that new information. Graham, what's a more modern day example of a theory once considered outrageous that turned out to be factually supported by evidence? Well, for example, continental drift, which, uh, which everybody is familiar with today and which we, you know, we, we, we regard as a, as a fact that the continents move around and you can even see the jigsaw puzzle uh, on, the, on the globe of the Earth. But when Alfred Wegener uh, proposed the, the theory of plate tectonics continental drift uh, back in the early 19, 1900s, around about 1918, 1920, I believe, uh, he was ridiculed, uh, humiliated, accused of being a madman uh, the idea was seen to be patently absurd, uh, and another 30 years passed before the idea uh, was accepted. And now, of course, we all regard it as, uh, as, as plain fact and, and, and obvious. Uh, but that poor individual had to go through really a, a humiliating public pillory uh, because he was proposing an idea that, that turned out to be completely correct. Uh, amazing. You've also said that there's a quote mother culture from which all ancient historical civilizations sprang from. Can you explain what that concept entails? Well again let me be clear. Uh, I am proposing an idea for discussion. I'm not, comp I'm not, not, not claiming that I am uh, in possession of some indisputable fact. Uh, I think we should consider the possibility of a forgotten episode in human history. I think we should consider the possibility that our picture of history and prehistory may not be complete and that cataclysmic events have occurred. We know that cataclysmic events occur. They're part of the life of the Earth. The cataclysmic events have occurred on such a scale that they could have wiped out all traces of a great civilization of the past. Now, of course, academic historians and, and archaeologists uh, do a kind of belly laugh whenever one mentions the word Atlantis. Uh, but let's not forget that Atlantis comes down to us. The oldest surviving reference to Atlantis comes down to us from the Greek philosopher Plato. And he tells us that 9,000 years before the time of Solon, which is 9,600 BC or 11,600 years ago, a great civilization was destroyed in cataclysmic floods and earthquakes and vanished beneath the sea. Uh, and, and, and he said that the disaster was so complete that humanity was obliged to begin again like children with no memory of what went before. Now, it just so happens that Plato's date, 11,600 years ago, 9,600 BC in our calendar, Plato's date fits exactly with an episode called the Younger Dryas, which geologists recognize, which did culminate in dramatic flooding and earthquakes. Uh, and, and it's really odd if Plato made the whole thing up that he managed to pick a date that fits perfectly with modern geological understanding of cataclysmic events at the end of the last ice age. Now, the suggestion is that that 
Atlantis by any other name. By the way, you need to know that the, the story of Atlantis comes to us from Plato, but there's an identical story in India, for example. In fact, this story is repeated with different names all around the world. Uh, and the suggestion is that there were survivors of the cataclysmic collapse of that prehistoric civilization, and that those survivors settled in various points around the world, in Egypt, in South America, in Mexico, uh, in Mesopotamia, and so on and so forth, and sought to preserve and protect the knowledge that their civilization had built up to, to, to create some kind of institution which would pass it down to the future. And this is the remote common origin that explains the similarities between these widely separated ancient cultures. I want to get into a little bit of these historical inconsistencies. Uh, what is the earliest account of longitude and astronomical mapping that modern science claims couldn't have existed before the 18th century or so? Well, see, in order to do longitude, you need an accurate chronometer, an accurate timekeeping device, if you like, which will, which will tell you uh, the time at a particular point on the Earth's surface, and then you can then compare it with local noon at the point you are and realize uh, how, far, how far away you are from that point on the Earth's surface. Um, and we did not have chronometers that were capable of keeping accurate time on ships until the late 1700s. And so our civilization has been able to plot longitude accurately since the late 1700s. Before that, there was always a danger that your dead reckoning would be off and that you would sail suddenly into a cliff or a coastline that you didn't expect to be there because your calculations were wrong. But once we had accurate chronometers that could keep time on board ship, the longitude problem was solved. And that's the late 1700s. The problem is that there are ancient maps from well before the 1700s, which show the world, A, as it looked during the last ice age, and B, which have highly accurate longitudes. And these maps, in most cases, were created in the 14, 15, 1600s, but they were based on older source maps, which are now lost to us. For example, the famous Piri Reis map, the Admiral, Turkish Admiral Piri Reis tells us in his own handwriting on his map that he based it on more than 100 older source maps that he believed had come from the Library of Alexandria. They were falling apart, and so he decided to preserve the information on them on his map. And in the process, uh, he uh, incorporated extremely accurate longitudes, which we must then conclude were present on those older source maps. Recently, an Australian paleoanthropologist discovered the possibility of yet another species of humans that existed alongside our ancestors up to 14,000 mm. years ago. What do these constant findings say about our understanding of human evolution at this point? I think, I think what they say more generally about our understanding of the past is that our picture of the past is very incomplete. I mean, we've been going along for the last 50 or 60 or more years thinking that, yes, there was Neanderthal man, and also there was Homo sapiens sapiens, our own species, and that was it, and Neanderthal man became extinct, what, 30, 35, perhaps 25,000 years ago, and then we were the only human species on the planet. But within the last few years, we've had the discovery of uh, Homo floresiensis from the island of Flores, in, uh, in Indonesia, and also the so-called Red Deer people in, in China, both of whom were a distinct, different species of human, uh, and both of whom survived until about 12,000 years ago. So this tells us that we, we really can't claim to have, perhaps ever, to have a complete picture of the past. And that means that we should at least keep a small fragment of our minds open to extraordinary possibilities in the past. And one of those extraordinary possibilities, the one that I've concerned myself with, is the possibility of a great lost civilization, which is memorialized in myths and traditions all around the world. And of course, you, you've talked extensively about Stonehenge, the Great Pyramids, how all these things kind of point to that theory, Graham. I want to get into your TED Talk last year uh, called The War on Consciousness that was pulled off YouTube. On the TEDx blog, it says, we didn't censor you, but were you surprised that your wildly popular talk was pulled? And what does this say about the institution of TED, which is portrayed as this beacon of, of free academic thought? It was a great disappointment for me because I had the highest opinion of TED uh, prior to this. But myself and my colleague uh, Rupert Sheldrake both gave talks at a TEDx conference in London. Uh, both of those talks considered 
what would be regarded perhaps as extraordinary possibilities about consciousness by mainstream science and both of those talks were subsequently deleted from the TEDx YouTube channel and then because there was a massive outcry across the internet at this act that was seen as censorship TED reinstalled them in what my friend Rupert calls the naughty corner uh, on their own website where with great difficulty they could be found and seen again and commented upon now the reason that TED gave for pulling our talks uh, they said it was because our talks were not in accord with mainstream science but every single reason that they gave for saying that they subsequently had to delete and if you go to the relevant uh, w website now you'll find that Ted's original critiques of us are all crossed out by Ted themselves and our refutations are published there but still they refuse to put the talks back on YouTube, which suggests to me that a particular faction of science, which is the science that seeks to reduce all mysteries to matter, uh, which says that consciousness is purely an epiphenomenon of material activity in the brain and that there's nothing else to it. This is, this is not a fact. This is an ideological position within science, and that ideological position is presently making the decisions uh, for TED. And if you have a point of view which is opposite to that particular corner of ideology, you will not be able to express it on the TED medium. This is perhaps the most fascinating thing that I found out today looking through your Twitter feed. New research suggests that phobias and memories may be passed down through genetic switches, allowing offspring yes. to actually inherit experience. I mean, do you think this kind of groundbreaking research, what does it tell us about the naivete when it comes to our understanding of what consciousness really is? It tells us what we really should know already, that consciousness is the greatest mystery of science, and that it is perhaps the scientific mystery that we most urgently need to solve. And we have at our disposal an array of natural substances called the psychedelics, which allow us to switch on and off altered states of consciousness at will, which are a, a superb device, superb devices for exploring the mystery of consciousness, and yet for ideological reasons, and these reasons are totally ideological, the, the justification for them simply does not exist. For ideological reasons, we are prevented from doing so. Uh, and, and this is a cover for all sorts of other restrictions and controls on the freedom of the adult over his or her own body and over his or her own consciousness. Unfortunately, health care is constantly wheeled out as a reason to remove our sovereignty from us. And the trend of freedom in Western societies should be towards increased individual sovereignty rather than decreased individual sovereignty. Graham Hancock, absolutely incredible. I mean, people can watch you for hours and definitely have their consciousness expanded quite a bit. Where can people find out more about your work? GrahamHancock.com uh, on, uh, on the internet and uh, my, Facebook, uh, my Facebook account as well is very active and I, I spend a lot of time uh, talking there and that is author.grahamhancock. Thank you so much for taking the time out today, Graham, to shed a little bit of insight into the world. Graham Hancock, author, philosopher, really appreciate it. Thank you.